When I first started in horticulture, <laughs> we had the NPK. Yeah, that's not specific. You'll see on the back of fertilizer packets. I was brought up in chemical chemicals a lot when I started this trade. Um, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus. All right. Um, that's all we thought you needed plants to grow. Oh, then we discovered oh, there was iron. Oh, they needed yeah. iron. Calcium wasn't bad for them. Rough minerals. A few other things. Lots and lots of different things. Now we're up to about, oh well, 20 years ago we worked out that they needed about 12. Now we're up to about 42. <laughs> different chemicals, different elements of the plants actually need to grow. Do plants need, need arsenic to grow? Did you say do they? Yeah. They do grow. Yeah, they do. Yeah. They need arsenic to grow. Yeah. If you don't, if you, they can't get access to arsenic, they will not, they, will not, they cannot grow. Very small quantities, oh, yeah. but they need it nonetheless. Do a, does, is it on the back of a, of a fertilizer packet? Does it have, does it have 42 chemicals? No, no, it does not. How do you get it? It's in your soil. Oh, yes. Myth number two. Every single piece of soil on this planet can grow plants. It has the nutrient to grow plants in every soil. I don't care if you go to Saudi Arabia, they've done the tests. That soil is good enough to grow plants in. It has the nutrient in it. You don't need to add it. What you need to do is add the biology. You get the biology in the soil, you can grow any plant. It's that, that's it. We'd love to tell you how you've got to buy this chemical, you've got to buy that chemical, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. No, you need to get the biology in your soil. They'll fix it for you. It's all there already. So in PK, how else do we, how else do we help the system run though? By providing all the other nutrients. It's in your soil, but we can actually access to them. If I plant a apple tree, what about removing the If I plant an apple tree here, the root system of an apple tree do this. They're like that. Where you like? To, everybody thinks when you grow up, when you typically when you have a when you have a plant, everybody thinks it's like a. Um, the root systems go like that, typically. Yeah. No, not all root systems do that. Apple trees do not do that, they do this. And so their root systems actually don't go down that far, which is why they don't like grass, because grass actually competes with them. They don't like each other very much. And so if I have an apple tree and I've planted an apple tree there, what I would do in these areas underneath, all that space you've got in there, is you put something like a comfrey in, which has a deep, very deep root system. Root system of a comfrey will can go down five meters into the soil or more. And when it does that, it accesses all the nutrient load down in here. And then the plant dies back and dumps the nitrogen, dumps all the additional fertilizers on top where they where it's actually more accessible to the other plants so it mines your soil for you well, things like that so really good plants humphreys and things like that so if i come along and i plant a comfrey there <coughs> and another it's lots and lots of different mineral accumulators what's that Mineral accumulator, <coughs> really good. So, I've got a rhubarb over here. Is it going to hit my cup, my apple? Yep. Yeah. Oh, that's the This is sorrel. All right. Really lovely. This is this particular one we grow here. This is Transylvanian sorrel. <laughs> it is from Transylvania. The, the variety of French sorrel. Yep. Yeah. Doesn't it cut the root systems go down again, really deep. So I put a sorrel under there. So we've just solved the other problem with fertilizer. So fertilizer is now fixed. So all the other PKs are now fixed right, by doing that type of thing. Now I'll quickly come back to the nitrogen fixes for everybody so we don't get too far ahead of it. Now this one's called a honey locust. The locust. Locust. 
Do you like satanical name? Yes. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Bladitsia is the botanical name. Oh, Bladitsia. Now, the other good things about honey locusts are you can eat the seed. You can actually eat the seed of these guys. It's actually really nutritious for you. Um, it tastes very similar. The, the, little, the little seeds are actually really good. They taste a bit like peas. Like peas. Um, I've got, between, depending on the cultivar, it's got between 10 and 24% protein in them. Um, and about 87% carbon carbohydrate. So it's really quite a good form. Hey, it may not be quite as palatable as some peas, but I don't know if I'm recommending it, but certainly give them a nibble or two with the bean, but you can eat them. Traditionally, we've used them, and the pods are really good. You open up the pods of the young, young pods, so they've got a, a molasses like substance in them. You can eat that. Very, very good. Lots and lots and lots of sugar. Really high in sugar. But the pods and all those are directly uh, available to stock. So you can feed them to goats, you can feed them to pigs, you can feed them to sheep, all those sorts of things. They're equivalent to oats in nutrient content. So if you've got a mixed sort of farm, you can certainly plant something like that. The wood of the honey locust too is extremely hard. So there's firewood for people who are concerned about that. If you, if you coppice um, a honey locust, Coppice. Coppice means I've got there's my root, there's my tree. That's now a tree. If I cut it off at the base, it'll reshoot. Right? And when you do that, you can get what they call post wood out of these trees. You like post? Yeah. Post wood? Um, untreated in the ground, they'll last for about a hundred years. So they're really good. Uh, typically, depending on the, on the cultivar, and that would be, if you're doing that, you wouldn't plant that one, for example. That's a, a, a grafted form, you plant the milk with actual seed grown ones. Um, typically, you're looking for turn around about every um, 10 years or so. Right? On a, on a, on a, yep, about 10 years to get to that size. And then you, you'd harvest it, and then you'd probably do another one, typically about 14 years. So it takes time, but it it's on a rotation. There's trees in Europe that actually live in this sort of um, process that actually outlive the original trees by 100 to 200 years in some cases. So it's, enough, it's, a real, so it's a really good tree to plant. And it picks up nitrogen. And then also it's deciduous, so all the leaves drop down and give you mulch. Another good thing. Don't buy mulch. That's true. So self mulching system. Another tree you can do that with is a black locust. That's a Rubinia. <coughs> Similar sort of thing. Again, nitrogen fixing right, in the system. Um, there's a whole stack of things. Um, the wood is again extremely hardy. It's a major crop over in Europe. It's one of their major um, timber trees in Europe. Um, and for our purposes, you can eat the flowers. You eat the flowers, eat, particularly on the white one. So this particular, you fry them. They're like fritters. They make really nice. Yeah. So just another advantage of growing something like that. A plant for a cowhide. From New Zealand, New Zealand native tree. It's a semi-deciduous tree, so it's going to lose some of its foliage, but not all. Very similar though, um, and that's a really good nitrogen fixing tree. It, most of these trees will last for quite, quite a few years. How many metres high are we talking for most of these, or are they small trees? They can be. They can grow up fairly high. But in our There's forest some, garden, in a forest garden system, you'd be fine. In an orchard where you want sun and things on your trees and things like that, you tend to keep them smaller. Yeah. And you coppice them and keep them smaller. Um, and I'll get into that later. Cowhide, I'll give you the botanical for that one as well. Really dense wood. 
Magnificent flowering tree. They have a pea flower, yellow pea flower hangs in bunches. The wattle birds go nuts for these things. They're really good. Why would I want a wattle bird in my orchard? Incredibly territorial and they'll chase most of the, the blackbirds away if they've got a, a, a range of different plants to feed from. So I'll actually claim it as a carrot tree and they'll drive the other birds out. And they do eat a little bit of fruit, but the no. blackbirds and the cockies and things like that are the main predators. So if you get birds as your allies, you start health the system a little bit. And birds, what do birds add to the system as well? What's this? Poo? Yes. Poo's cool. <laughs> Poo's cool. We like, we like lots of bird poo in our, in our system. Really good. And, the, and sometimes they toss it from the ground. Yep. So that's another tree flute. Um, right, this is a, what they call Circus or Forest Pansy, Canadensis. Forest Pansy. Right, forest pansies. Also called uh, a Judas tree. There's another oh, name for You may have heard well. of these. Yes. Um, it's, it was allegedly the tree that Judas Iscariot hung themselves on. Oh, a myth, another myth. Um, these are great fun because they have edible flowers. You can eat mm. those. They're really good. And edible pods. So it's another good food source for us. And they're going to provide nitrogen to the system. And they're really spectacular and they're really good for bees. Yes. They're really good plants. And the honey eaters love those ones as well, funny enough. Okay. Everybody got those down? Yeah. Yep. They don't get too big either if you can see them there. No, they're a smaller drawing tree. Typically you're looking, oh, it's about this sort of height. <laughs> Wood's extremely tough. Uh, tree lucerne is another common one too. You probably in the permaculture circles typically look for a tree lucerne a lot. That's a good option for fixing It Doesn't last as long, and typically you use that for moth production, and it's good. They're a fantastic tree, but um, yeah, everybody's typically knows about those. They don't last long, so they're a good pioneer system, like our wattles are. They're a good pioneer stage, whereas these plants we've been talking about last for a lot longer. Area, you were saying before you got problems with space you'd probably get something like this, which would be fine. This is another nitrogen fixer that we use a lot. This is a silverberry or Eleagnus, more of a bush. Um, these, I love these things because they fulfill a lot of criteria in the garden. Um, they can be hedged, they will grow quite well in the shade because they're not legumes. They have a different association with a different form of bacteria. Legumes need to grow at the fixed nitrogen, they have to grow in the sun. These guys do not, they can grow in the shade really well. They call them silverberries because of the leaf, but they also produce a nice fruit. So they slightly astringent. Um, you know it if you eat them too early, <laughs> well and truly, like that. Um, but when they're ripe, absolutely fantastic. And they have lovely perfume flowers as well. Really good. And this is another, another form of early agnus. This is more like the ground cover small shrub form. So there's an early agnus for almost every position. Some of them are evergreen, some of them are deciduous. Um, then some of the yellow agnes um, in Europe are one of our major crop, they produce a, a large fruit. We can't get them here yet, but I'm working on it. Okay. So um, they're really good because they're all nitrogen fixes and they just look fantastic and they're tough as nails. Mm -hmm. right. And some beach nails. This is Rotunda folius, this particular one. It's a low ground cover form. Um, no so we talk, and we talked about a few about um, some, not some um, mineral accumulators. Mm -hmm. The classic mineral accumulator is, of course, conflict. Oh. Wherever that is. It's down here. There it is. Just about going back to the ground there. You can see the root system. Really strong plants. All right. So that's what a conflict plant looks like for those that have never grown one before. Really good bee plant as well. Is that why it's really hard to get rid of them? Yeah, uh, we grow like... a particular form called Bocking 14, um, which is a non-invasive form. If you get the normal conferent, it'll pop up there, there, wherever. So get the non-invasive one. We also have <coughs> another one, which is a dwarf form as well, which I'd recommend, which is lovely. They, they typically get about, probably about a metre high. Right? Dwarf one's about half that. 
Another good mineral accumulating plant is called Russian borage. It's deciduous at the moment, but you can just see the leaf. Really pretty. Good mineral accumulator, deep root systems. It's not in, as invasive as normal borage, it's a true perennial. Borage is good, by the way, in the garden. It certainly is borage here. Um, good bee plant. It's one of the very first plants to actually produce good flowers in, in my garden. The real, the real. <coughs> mineral accumulator is this one. This is, Tur this is Turkish rocket. Um, it's an extremely deep root system. It's of the brassica family. Which, it's like cabbages and those sorts of things. Um, you can eat the leaf. The leaf's really good. Very, very spicy. It is like a very spicy rocket. True perennial. Dies down, comes back up again. Um, but the main crop on this guy is the actual flower heads, which are bright yellow. And you pick them like you do broccoli and steam it. And then they come up again next year. And next year, and next year. And it's one of the main plants that we put in a system like this are plants that produce flowers like that, which are called umbels. Botanically, they're called an umbel. Right. This one is a um, earth, earth chestnut. You can eat the, you eat the actual foliage, so it's quite tasty, good like parsley, um, and so, and then you've got the flowers, and then you've got the bulbs as well, which taste like chestnut, and you them up, and you just cook them up, it's fantastic. Why would I want lots of different flowers in my orchard? These? Predators and... And everything else, yeah. The more it's about getting rid of the work. I do when I when I first planted my forest garden at home, I put in some cherry trees, and for the first two or three years, every time we put the uh, every time the new foliage would come out, they get wiped out by black aphid, big time. This awful. Anybody seen black aphid on cherry trees? It's shocking stuff. It just deform the leaves, it's like that. Do I get them anymore? No. What about I don't get them anymore slugs? at all. Um, I don't get cherry sluggers either because oh. I've planted enough of these other things to encourage a permanent supply of insects, predatory insects. 98% of all insects on the planet are beneficial. There's only a few that are actually nasty. Many different plants would you need to protect one as, as much as much diversity as you can possibly imagine. Right. But if you're going to plant, put a tree in, you might as well make sure it's going to provide a few different. Um, why plant one one plant that's just going to produce a flower when you can plant another plant that's going to produce flower, fruit, or whatever, or nitrogen fix or whatever? So you want the, the plants I tend to select for are going to provide multiple benefits in the same space. Um, and things like this, because I can get a yield from that. Um, you know, to have these shaped flowers, I started thinking that you have to leave all the seed heads there over winter rather than taking them off. You, you don't have to. But how, how do the insects eat over winter in them? Um, you can, well, you can do that. I mean, you can have, you can have habitat. Um, plants over winter, um, you'll get ladybirds hiding in the crevices and bark. Or fruit trees and oh, things okay. like that. So they don't actually. They don't, yeah. It's this is mainly put in as a food source for them because oh. it's a quick food source and, and they need sugars. That's why we that's why we plant those sort of things. And it looks pretty. Um, well, they, they a plant like a nasturtium, for example, mm. really good. You can eat the you can eat the leaves. This particular cultivars are one of the dwarf cultivars. You can get large ones as well. Um, quite good, and they are still mineral accumulators. And they'll sell stuff. The stations are particularly good. Mineral accumulators. Um, on a shrub level, I tend, to, I always make sure I've got a space for, um, for one of these guys for the um, elderberries. Elderberries are an incredibly useful plant. This particular one's Canadensis. This is a smaller growing than the normal European um, elderberry. Elderberries. Provide those big umbly sort of flowers like that. Massive thing. This particular one's called Maxima. Its flowers are about this wide. Oh my God. Massive. And um, the other use for elderberries is what? Cordial? Wine, yeah, absolutely <laughs> wine. Very useful. Cordial, really good. And you can eat the flowers. You just you can you put them in fritters and actually eat the flowers. So they're pretty
pretty useful for. Are, are they a sun? Like, I've got an algebraic plant that yep. I have yet to put in. Are they something you have to have a support for and put in the sunshine, or are they like a self standing truck? Just yeah, they're a, yeah, exactly. They're a small, um, this particular <laughs> form you're looking at this high and about that wide. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. right. Whereas the European, I would vary up here about that, that wide. Much bigger. So this, um, if you've got small spaces, much bigger. So we're starting to get some pest control by dividing a lot of different plants under your fruit trees as well, and some more food. How far away from the root system should we take? Doesn't really matter because um, depending on the fruit trees, um, you. Um, you can compartmentalise the soil mass. So different different um, plants within the soil occupy different spaces and different zones. Right. So you've got to be aware of that. Absolutely. Um, you can't plant too many, you wouldn't be able to plant potatoes under the fruit tree typically because you don't want to dig it up, things like that. Fruit tree, um, but you can do things like this one. This is a... a um, uh, Oxalis, does anybody know Oxalis? Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is Same a... family. This is an edible Oxalis. This is called Oka. <laughs> or New Zealand yam, if we've got any Kiwis. A Kiwis? Okay. New Zealand yam or Oka. O C A. It's a plant that comes from the. Um, from Peru. And it's it loves to grow under. I grow this under my fruit trees because it loves the shade, oh. and it's a good ground cover. It's just dying down now, but to give you an idea, it produces these lovely oh my tubers, God. Yeah. really good size. And you just yeah, you just harvest these. When you go and have a wander in the nursery later, we've got some growing in some of the pots out there, and they actually produce them quite close to the surface in the mulch layer. Mm -hmm. So you can grow these under a fruit tree, no problem, and not dig them up. And you just, you can eat them raw, or you can just, or we can stir fry them and steam them and treat them like potatoes. Another, another plant to nitrogen fix it. This is a little native one for a lot of people who like the natives. This is an indigofera. Right. Really lovely. You can just see those little things. It comes out with lovely cascading pink flowers. Really good bee, tra bee plant. No, you can't eat it, it's just pretty. Um, but it's really good for nitrogen fixing on a small scale. It grows quite well in the shade. It looks like a legume plant. It's like... Yep, it's a legume. Oh. If you've got the trees established, you can start to plant things mm -hmm. like currants, red currants, black currants, all those gooseberries, that type of thing. Um, Boots in the hills. Uh, yep, you guys can plant your black, your black currants. No one else can. You will not get fruit on your black color um, unless you're in the hills. You might get the cold. You need the cold. Oh, it's the cold, is it? Gooseberry's even worse. Gooseberry's worse. Gooseberry's worse. Yeah. I've got you need the cold or you won't get it. I get them, I'm in Wollydale, I get reasonable reduction, but you need the cold. Or the, not. Um, the good thing about black currants, though, and you can still plant them, is you can use the foliage for, for flavouring. And that comes all the way up to pruning. <coughs> This is typically what you'll get when you get a fruit tree. But I mean, I recently discovered that um, there's two ways to look at these things. If you want, um, according to some French um, researchers who have been looking at fruit and fruit production in, in orchard systems, their basic example was you want a tree mm -hmm. or do you want a fruit tree? Fruit tree. No? It's because as soon as this, this, all trees want to be pruned, so depending on how you prune them or train them, um, if you, this sort of simple technique basically will stop you pruning your fruit trees quite as much and cut down a lot of your workload. Um, as soon as you can see what we've typically done there, this would have been a single whip going to the sky when it was first grafted, and then we've cut it out and we've got this now vase shape. That's your traditional way. Of growing a fruit tree in most home based orchards and things like that. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that, that's fine. You can get access to your fruit, you've got air movement around your fruit, which is important because it cuts down diseases, <coughs> things like that. Um, and, by, and, the other, and the other thing you can start to see is 
you've got these sort of side branches. Plants produce hormones, um, and the hormones control how the plant grows. Um, if I, for example, wanted this to um, change from, if I, if I don't prune this tree <coughs> next week, next, what's going to happen next summer? It's just going to go straight yeah. up. Yeah. Yep. That's because all the hormones up the top of this, up, up the top here are telling it that's what it needs to do. It needs to grow higher. Right? If I take that branch and do that with it, the hormones change. Now the hormones will get to produce side branches and fruiting spoon, which is what we want. The one simple way of doing exactly that is to actually take these fruits and do this. I'll put it up on the table so you can see. So if you do this, you'll cut, sorry, you'll cut about 80% of your uh, pruning time down if you follow this sort of simple So it's training the tree rather than cutting the tree. Can you do that with an established tree? As long as they're supple like that, you can do it. So you take them from that. And within a few months, you'll start to see. The, you want to try and get it down as far as you can. And what happens is this will produce all productive side shoots now and fruit. You might want to go to the sky. So once, once you've done that, after a few months, that it will sort of keep that shape there, will it? Or yeah, exactly. Once you've done it, it's locked in. If you do that with nylon... You do... Wire is wire's quite useful because it needs to be quite taut, yeah, quite strong. And it's only temporary. Once you've done that to all of those yeah. branches, for example. Yeah, no, I'm just thinking about a park situation where I wouldn't really want to put wires to be... Oh, okay. Yeah, you know, anything, like anything that's going to... Whatever you need to do. Yeah. yeah. The wires are good because you can reuse them on different <laughs> So it's an orchard-based system. Yeah. It works quite well. So that's basically what you're doing. Yeah. So you're changing the variety of the trees. Does it's it matter how close your trees are? Like, how close would you plant them in order to be able to do that? Um, the orientation is important. Orientation. Yep. Which gets down... So you basically, what, you, what you're aiming to do is, rather than making a, a tree like this, you're making a fruit tree. Right. But you're growing in a single column. So you've got that chimney straight up and down, and that's what you want. Right? Because it's more compact and it keeps the air movement. Right? And every, now, good talk. Um, what you're basically doing is you take out um, any, like if you're in, I grew it easier to grow. So, we'll take the apple for example here. The pattern of, of is what you're basically aiming to get is in that row, there's something like that. So you take it, anything that's going to come across, yep. you take that out. Mm -hmm. Anything that's growing towards the other tree, you take out. You want that sort of star pattern if you're growing in an orchard system. Right? To keep, it makes it easier to pick. <coughs> So it's going like that. In my food forest. And you can train that, you can do that with your nitrogen fixing trees as well, if you want. The Levitsius that he uses in this in this orchard, for example. That's what he's done with those. He actually gets the plant, gets the eggs and ties them down. Very, very effective. And that'll reduce most of your pruning. Right, that 80 to 90 percent. Um, and so you would take out, in this case, he's not quite right. So you swing him this way and you swing him that way, and that's about right. And then you need another one coming out this way. And then you get rid of all the others. So you, you're aiming, ideally, you're aiming for about, about 12 main branches in the fall. That's basically it. 12 main branches at reasonable intervals. So as this grows up, I'll do exactly the same thing up here <coughs> and tie them back down in the next season right? and take out a lot of this stuff here. You tend to clear out a lot of these sort of 
bit, and you keep the, you open up your your um, about six uh, about a foot along these branches. You take everything out, as I was mainly to, just to keep the airflow. Yeah. Yeah. That's basically the system in a nutshell. That'll work um, on all trees, John. Sorry. That'll work on all fruit trees. Yeah. 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 Pears, plums, all that. The second layer. Because, because it's all, and that's because that's what you're doing traditionally in pruning. When you prune the tree, you're aiming to get this sort of, or when you're spidering or things like that, that's what you're aiming to do. So is reduce that space because when you do that, you're going to get more fruit for smaller spaces. What, what style is it called? Like the what what it, what's, what it's called? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, it's, it's, no. I think it's, 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 it's called a chimney. It's basically a chimney or pipe <laughs> pruning. So that's what they're called. Um, it's particularly good. John, when you're doing the second layer of that, that yep. Yep. are you aligning the branches that you're pulling down above the others or in between? Above them. Because you want that basic. You want, so you want that basic. In an orchard system. Yeah. If it's not critical of your place. Then you can be a little bit more creative. But it's just sure, but the basis, the basis is, is the same. Mm -hmm. And you just reduce that amount of time because you've got a pretty And you've just saved cutting back an enormous amount of, of, of productive material. And I don't need a ladder. And you don't need a ladder, exactly. So there's nothing to stop you growing, um, for example, a kiwi berry in with your trees once they're established, particularly. You wouldn't do it now, but kiwi berry, does anybody know what kiwi berry is? <coughs> yes, it's a... Kiwi berries are like a kiwi fruit, but they're about so big and they're, and they're puzzless, so you can eat them like grape. They're really good. And they love the shade. They really need to grow well in the shade, so they're mm. ideal for this sort of thing. Um, there's a number of different forms. So how long does a tree need to establish before you plant something? Oh, you want to start to get, you know, because that will grow fairly quickly being a climber. But bear in mind, climbers are from forest systems and they want to reach the light. So, yeah, you've got to take that into consideration. So you'd want your, your fruit tree to be long term established before you do it. And grapes? Yeah, yeah, you can grow grapes. Oh. Yeah, depending on the grape. Often grapes, are, uh, depending on the variety, because grapes love a lot of air, they get mildew just like that. So oh. you've got to be very careful. But you can certainly do it. We've got a variety that could use a small, which is pure, and it's very small grapes, uh, but produces a lot of them. It's virtually immune to disease. And what sort of fruit tree would you buy on? Oh, it doesn't matter. So even an apricot? Apricot, yeah. whatever. Yeah, it doesn't matter. That looks like a, um, a climbing thing in the front on the far side, if you're looking for That one? That one. Oh, raspberry. Yeah, oh. you can grow raspberries under fruit trees. They're quite easy to grow under fruit trees. Uh, they actually benefit from the shade of fruit trees. Um, this one is a bit of a rarity. This is an evergreen. Um, we're just starting to experiment with this one. I'm just going to show off now. Um, this is an evergreen um, kiwi fruit, which produces reasonable fruit and nice red flowers. So it's an evergreen. Um, now, in the other thing I haven't covered in here is that's your lawn, and you, so you're going to mow that, etc. Um, it's good to have as much diversity in your lawn as you can. Um, what do I mean by diversity? Dandelions, malign dandelion. You can eat these guys, they're really good for you. Um, they break up the soil, they're really good at conditioning the soil. Um, you don't have to go and kill them, you know, just let them dry. When the pasture improves, they will go, they will disappear. Once they've done their job, yeah, they'll just disappear. If the soil, if, if the soil's been fixed, because they're there to fix the soil, like big, that big deep root system, that's what it's doing, it's trying to break out the soil. What, um, these sort of things, what soils, what plants, everything is trying to move in succession. It's trying to go from bare soil to forest. And these weeds are the repair system. That's what they do. They just want to fix it so it can be a forest again. And we kill them.